Hey everyone, we're here again with another interview. Today we have Richard Zoglin. He's a theater critic and the author of the book, Mike. Comedy at the Edge. Comedy at the Edge about the uh, 1970s stand-up world. Uh, and we're gonna talk to Richard a little bit about the book and the interviews that he conducted and stand-up and theater and just all lots of cool stuff. So Richard, thanks so much for taking the time to come and talk Thank to you. us today. Sure, great to be here. And I uh, hope, so, go ahead. Yeah, so right off the bat, how how did stand-up kind of enter your world? Uh, when, did, when did it first become something you were aware of? Well, I grew up watching stand-up on TV. I grew up in the days of variety shows when there was always a stand-up comedian. Uh, so I got to know them that way. And then I started listening to comedy records, you know, from sort of junior high school days. Um, I just, as early as I can remember listening to records, it was listening to comedy records. Uh, the Smothers Brothers, Bill Dana, old Jose Jimenez, people don't even remember. But, um, and then later on, uh, in, in, in my college years, I really got into people like George Carlin and Robert Klein, who really seemed to be changing stand-up comedy. And I, I kind of followed them and, and their contemporaries and later comedians all through my college years and, and, and on in, into my career and always wanted to write something about that era when stand-up comedy sort of changed, the, the, the late 60s and 70s. And that's why I eventually got around to that book, which took a, a, a little while to finally get to. Yeah, one review was that it was the, the topic that was like hiding in plain sight, I believe, for yeah. a long time, and you were kind of the one to find it. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, wrote about television for a long time. I was a TV critic. And mm -hmm. I always noted at the time, and this is way, say, back in the 80s, people didn't really think of stand-up comedy as its own genre. Uh, people who, re if they reviewed stand-up comedians, it was in, in the context of them being on TV or something, mm -hmm. say, Bill Cosby, uh, Roseanne, a little later. But, um, and, and the, the whole idea of talking about stand-up comedy per se as its own genre was fairly new. And, and I, it was kind of, because it was partly television, it was partly theater, but um, there was really not a, a body of work of, of people writing about stand-up comedy. So uh, I felt that um, I, you know, I wanted to step into that void and particularly that era that I kind of grew up with, the, the, the late 60s, 70s, uh, and all those comedians, mm -hmm. uh, starting with, I'd say, George Carlin in, in those years. Right. Well, I thought if we could kick off with uh, some of the key figures here is, I guess we have to start with Lenny Bruce. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Lenny Bruce, I was not a, a, a someone who really knew much about Lenny Bruce. He was a little before my, my when I really got into stand-up. And, um, but I, you know, looking back, he really was the, the transitional figure. He was the guy who uh, sort of changed stand up from being sort of disconnected gag lines to being this sort of monologues that, that you know, were a social, social commentary, uh, very personal, very uh, rebellious, I mean, uh, uh, irreverent. Um, Flout, uh, flouting the standards, you know, the uh, uh, social standards of the time. And he, he was, he kind of sort of made stand-up comedy in this kind of rebellious act, I would say. Mm -hmm. But uh, all the comedians who came after that looked up to Lenny Bruce as someone who really showed that, you know, doing stand-up comedy was not just doing gag lines, not just making jokes, but really talking about what was going on in society, in politics, in their own lives, um, you know, relations between the sex, sexes, etc. Uh, something stand-up comedy could really be something relevant and important, and not just a guy standing up there making jokes. So it was uh, I think Lenny Bruce had sort of opened the door to people like George Carlin and uh, and Richard Pryor and Robert Klein, the people who in the late '60s, early '70s, really brought stand-up comedy into the next generation, the generation that was sort of the 60s generation that were anti-establishment, uh, the, the, the kind of protest generation, challenging all the uh, sort of old, old-fashioned 50s um, morality and standards and um, 
political views and so forth. So uh, Lenny Bruce's rebellious kind of stand-up uh, fit right in with what these guys wanted to do, questioning all the values that they they right. kind of grown up with, and stand up was a vehicle for that. Yeah, his story always has a a bittersweet feeling to it. When any time I read about him or watch a documentary on him, um, the one story I really love in the book is uh, him and Carlin getting arrested together. I mean, I knew of that, but I didn't know the detail of it. I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit of that for those who don't know, because it's a freaking great story. Yeah, well, Lenny Bruce, um, one of the things he did was use uh, the four letter words that were uh, not allowed at that time. Right. And he kept getting arrested for using them in nightclubs. And there was one, it was the Gate of Horn in uh, Chicago, which was a kind of beat era club, that uh, hip, hip club. And um, the police raided the place uh, and arrested Lenny Bruce. Uh, they told the audience, uh, George Carlin happened to be in the audience. He was performing at the time, but uh, he, after his uh, set, wherever he was uh, appearing, he walked over to the Gate of Horn to see Lenny's late show. And he was just caught in the crowd as they arrested Lenny Bruce. And, uh, Carlin kind of mouthed off to the cops and they threw him into the paddy wagon along with Lenny Bruce. So there he was riding uh, to jail with Lenny Bruce, his, his idol as a stand-up comedian. So that was where the link between the two of them really was, was full. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, to talk about like how Carlin kind of, um, I don't know if passing the torch is the right word, but he kind of continued that legacy would that be a right way of explaining it perhaps well sure he, you know, I mean, he did his own thing but it's kind of continuing continue, that legacy but, but he uh he saw lenny challenging the kind of standards and and moral sort of uh, standards of, of society in terms of language and in terms of the kind of subject matter that you could talk about i mean he would uh talk about things that were considered quote unquote bad taste uh, he also was a definite political dissenter. He was part of that late 60s sort of protest. He grew his, grew his hair long and, and grew a beard at a time when that was pretty unusual because he, he had been a straight-laced kind of, uh, you know, stand-up comedian. He'd been on the Ed Sullivan show a lot of times and uh, it, with short hair and kind of doing traditional material, very good material. He did a lot of... Uh, parodies of commercials and daytime television. And that's where I got to know him when I was a kid listening to that stuff. It was very, very funny, but it was still very much in the, um, in the realm of, of traditional stand-up comedians. But then he started, he, he got into the whole uh, anti-Vietnam, anti, the, the sort of anti-establishment uh, mentality of the younger generation in the counterculture years. And he started using his stand-up to sort of make his, his, his political views clear in terms of, say, drugs. I mean, he, he didn't like the way, you know, uh, drug use was so stigmatized. And, and here, people can be drinking alcohol and, and, and you know, that's fine. But uh, a kid who smokes marijuana is somehow, you know, it's, that's taboo. So those kind of things, that's what he called mm -hmm. in question wearing long hair and a beard. It, it kind of frightened people at that time. And, and he made fun of that. So he, uh, he really used stand up to sort of challenge all the sort of conventional wisdom and conventional morality of the era that he got from Lenny Bruce. And, but he adapted it for the new era, the changing times. Lenny had of course died in 1966. Yeah. Very interesting uh, that, that, that was right around the time that people like Carlin and, and prior were beginning to uh, to pick up on his his model and carry it forward. Shame. Um, yeah, Dave? yeah. Now I, I would love to know who, like, who else was jumping onto that particular type of stand-up. Like, who followed suit with Carlin? Well, Richard Pryor was very much in the same vein, very similar to Carlin in the sense that he had too had kind of grown up, had, had started out as being a kind of conventional stand-up comedian. He did a lot of uh, physical comedy. He was a funny young black guy who uh, uh, was, you know, people compared him a little bit to, to Bill Cosby. Um, he actually looked up to Bill Cosby, but he was, it was very palatable for a sort of mainstream uh, uh, middle-aged audience. 
until the late 60s when he started to talk about the black experience mm -hmm. and really and and his his, his ghetto uh, you know upbringing and and uh the kind of characters that he knew he was uh, and he got very edgy again using four letter words and so he he too was doing what Carlin was doing uh uh adapting it for the sort of racial issues that he was into at mm -hmm. the time so they were kind of twin uh, characters. I think they were the two most important characters of the late 60s. Along came Robert Klein was another very important um, comedian uh, still around today. And he was, I think, very influential at the time. He did something a little different. He too was very, very much a counterculture guy. He was a kind of long haired. He talked about uh, politics and, and social issues but he also brought the kind of improv um, style. He came out of Chicago and Second City okay. where the, the kind of improv comedy, which um, he sort of blended with traditional stand-up so that he would, he would play characters, he would do kind of little bits and he, he, he was as much an actor as a comedian. And, and that style was really uh, very influential. So mm -hmm. many of the comedians that followed would, so it wasn't just standing there and telling jokes, it was kind of enacting little scenes, uh, it, doing quick impressions, characters. Uh, and, and Klein was just a very, very good actor. And I think other, the comedians who came after him, and, and this was in the years when the comedy clubs were thriving in New mm -hmm. York mm -hmm. and LA, the improv and catch a rising star. So all sorts of young comedians were coming along and I think doing Robert Klein type of material. And it, it was also much more personal in terms of, uh, they would talk about their own experiences, dating or, uh, you know, riding the subway or whatever. And that too was something fairly new in the sense of when you think of the old stand-up comedian, the old um, uh, guys who used to, the Borscht Belt uh, guys who went on the Ed Sullivan mm -hmm. show, did just jokes about their wives and kids and this and that. But you never got to know them really personally. You you knew that this was always shtick. Um, they were just making up stuff to, to 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 make jokes about. Robert Klein talked about his own childhood in New York City, going to high school, the kind of teachers he had, the civil defense drills in the 1950s, uh, and, and and I think comedians that came after that. And I'm thinking people like, whoops, I've got a phone call, pushing uh, it away. Uh, the guys that came up in the comedy club scene in New York in the fifth, in the sixties, seventies, people like uh, Richard Lewis and Jay Leno, mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, you know several others. Uh, Elaine Boozer was one of the few women, but they were all, I think, very sort of into talking about their own lives and telling their their own uh, stories through stand-up comedy. So you got to know them; they were people. They were not just joke tellers on stage. I think that a lot of that was, uh, I'd, I'd say a lot of them would say Robert Klein was the kind of godfather of that kind of comedy. Although they were also very influenced by Carlin and Pryor as well. So that whole generation, then came along this, this generation of guys who were coming up in the comedy clubs in the 70s. Um, and they were, they, you know, as I say, Richard Lewis and, and Jay Leno and, um, and then you, you had a whole group of people like uh, Andy Kaufman who were doing different sorts of, who stand-up comedy started to, to really get, uh, flower in more interesting ways. There were guys who were, there were very personal stand-up uh, mm -hmm. comedians and then there were the ones who were doing more abstract kind of stuff that was more uh, performance art kind of um, conceptual comedy. They were not uh, they were definitely not talking about themselves personally. They were they were doing characters. They were doing put-ons. And I'm thinking of people like Andy Kaufman and Steve Martin, yeah. particularly. You uh, said you saw, uh, saw Andy Kaufman live? Yeah, yeah, I would. What was that experience like? Oh, wow. I, was, I was living in New York in the, in the mid-70s, just starting yeah. out my career writing. And uh, I would go to the comedy clubs at the Improv, and Catch a Rising Star with the two big clubs. I remember seeing, actually, I remember one particular night at the Improv, and I saw three three comedians that I just thought were the greatest. Uh, one of them was Richard Lewis, 
who uh, was, you know, the first time I'd ever seen him and he was really great. Um, the other was, I can't remember his name now, uh, but the third was uh, a guy who uh, was, I'd seen in, in the restroom uh, with this funny little voice, uh, but this is before, in between sets, and this guy was talking in this funny little foreign man voice. And I, I you know, it seemed kind of weird. Uh, you know, about half an hour later, I see him on stage, and that was Andy Kaufman doing his foreign man character. Mm -hmm. Sort of total put on that, you know, everybody is sort of puzzled. What is this guy? He's talking, he can barely talk English. And then uh, after about 15 minutes of, of that kind of shtick, he breaks into a, an Elvis Presley impression. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody knew it was a put on, and that was my first uh, glimpse of Andy Kaufman. So I felt uh, that was a real uh, <laughs> a memorable night for me. <laughs> wow. All the things that you just spoke about, like the change in comedy from the late 60s into the mid 70s, it, it seems like the timeline is, is really short. Like it, it sounds like it's only about seven or eight years that saw a major changeover. Um, yeah. What, what do you? What was the, the catalyst for all that? I mean, I know that there was a lot going on culturally, but why? Why did it affect stand up so greatly? Uh, I think just everything hit at once. There was so much with the the counterculture uh, revolution of the of the sixties, the late sixties. Uh, there was so much. You, you think about rock music. Think about how much was going on in rock music. Right. Time. Between the Beatles, you know, in sixty mm four. -hmm. And the early 70s, oh my God, how many groups you had and how many changes were going on in music. Everything from, you know, folk rock to, to, to hard, heavy metal. Right. Um, so, you know, it was just a time of great cultural ferment, mm -hmm. experimentation in all the arts, uh, in music and in stand-up comedy too. So these guys were uh, pushing forward and, and looking for, they, they, they wanted to be original and they were looking for, new ways of doing stand-up comedy. And so, so then you have in the 70s guys, uh, not just like Andy Kaufman, but you have guys like Robin Williams on the West Coast, of course. And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Doing this total improv kind of thing that was, um, you know, as we know, so frenetic and, uh, and like nothing, you know, uh, people had seen before. Uh, you had um, Steve Martin coming on and, and doing bad comedy, quote unquote, bad comedy, yeah, right. uh, pretending to be, you know, the worst comedian you'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that, th th this kind of conceptual comedy that was, the people were just trying to stretching the boundary. What can I do with stand-up comedy? And then other people uh, doing more personal stuff and, um, you know, in a more traditional vein, but moving, uh, into more frankness, more more uh, sexually frank uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So it just was a, a time of, uh, I think, you know, great cultural uh, experimentation that uh, things moved as fast in stand-up comedy as they did in, in, in music and, and other arts. Makes sense. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Robin Williams there. I know that you, you interviewed him. What was, the, what did you take away from that as both a comic and a person? What, what was he like? Well, I definitely remember Robin Williams was very serious, very, a very good interview. I remember doing the interview in New York um, and he was just, you know, a very kind of low key, serious, thoughtful, the exact opposite of what you sit on stage, uh, which isn't that, you know, surprising. Uh, a lot of comedians, you know, they turn it on on stage and they're serious guy in person. I think um, George Carlin was another one who was, uh, you know, very thoughtful and serious, uh, not a wisecracking guy. Other comedians that I interviewed were, were kind of much more fun and a little bit on when you talk to them in a natural way. Robert Klein was one like that. He was a funny guy. Um, and, uh, but Robin Williams, certainly a thoughtful guy. And, and I, I just wonder, you know, he was so frenetic on stage. And of course we know what happened to him. I, I'm sure that he had some manic depressive aspect to his personality, yeah. um, you know, to get that, to be that wired and racy on stage. Right. And that quiet uh, you know, it was, uh, in, in person is, is such a contrast that you wonder about, you know, what he did to get himself up or, or what, um, or what kind of personality he had that could 
could go so hot and cold like that. But I don't, I don't like to psychoanalyze people, but uh, <laughs> knowing what knowing what happened to him, um, you know, you know that he must have had psychological issues. But that that's what unleashes comedy a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Is, is there anything that you can recall in your interview with him that like really stuck out to you? Something that he said that has, I mean, I know it was a while ago, but Robin, it's um, stuck with you. Yeah. You know, I, there's nothing, um, you know, I don't, I honestly, you know, I'd have to open up my book. I probably have a good quote in there, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure my Robin, I just, uh, I just remember him being, um, you know, very thoughtful about his comedy, but I don't remember, uh, anything specific mm, okay try, try me on another one another comedian <laughs> all right was it uh, difficult to try to get all these guys and, and women as well to, to talk to you over the, the course uh, what was uh, that journey like uh, that, yeah, that's a good question they almost everyone was very happy to talk to me very eager to talk about those years uh, because they knew there were very important years for them in their career and they were um and they they were very happy that someone was taking it seriously and doing a a serious sort of cultural history of that era um you asked about men and women the the one who was the t the one who didn't talk to me was uh elaine boosler who uh probably few people today remember but at the time when there were very few women comedians stand up it was still very, very male dominated. I mean, today it's much different. But back then, to see a woman a, a comedian was, was pretty rare. She was the one who kind of uh, was definitely the most successful at that time in the mid 70s at the comedy clubs. Um, she didn't, her career didn't really take off. She uh, uh, was a stand up for quite a few years. and. She's still around, but she never had a hit TV series, or she she never really broke out in the way that some of the others, like uh, like Carlin and, and 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 Jerry Seinfeld and people like that, who right. mm -hmm. went on to much bigger things. But Elaine um, uh, never did, and I think she uh, remains a little bitter about it. And, and when I was doing this, she just felt she didn't want to talk. She I think she she wanted to do her own book and, and, and maybe okay. didn't want to participate. Yeah. So I was very disappointed in that, but um, I still give her a lot of credit in the book for, mm -hmm. um, for being groundbreaking as a, a, a female comedian. She did a lot of the material that uh, women comedians today, you know, have just expanded on so much in terms of the women's perspective in dating and, and some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some, acerbic comments about men and she she was uh it was good she was she was a good comedian sorry i didn't get to talk to her how long was this journey to to, to pull all that off over this time yeah that took me probably about three years i was also working uh on a time magazine at the time so uh it, it, yeah. it, uh, you know i had to do it in between things but uh it was it was I, I say, you know, maybe three years, but, but um, you know, researching it was my whole life, practically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I had such a head start going into it, uh, having, you know, seen all these guys, most of them heard all their records and everything. But uh, I got to talk to so many people. I talked to, you know, lots and lots of, of comedians, little known comedians, just some of the, the sort of, uh, Run of the mill guys who were doing the the improv and catch a rising star at the comedy clubs who who didn't go on to big things. I talked to them too, and I talked to the, the managers of the clubs and the uh, agents, and uh, it, you know it was uh, really uh, gave me a full sense of that whole era, the whole business of comedy in those days, um, and and the the personalities, and they were all they were all great to me. I, I really had. Some, some great entertaining interviews. That's awesome. So, Good to hear. Who is your favorite? Well, um, my favorite interview, gosh, you know, uh, I think- what, One of your favorites, I don't want to put you on this. You know what, I, I'm <laughs> because I, um, I, I like to talk, the guys who are so entertaining to talk to, um, you know, Jerry Seinfeld is, is a very good interview. He's, he's mm -hmm. funny. 
uh, and and he's thoughtful. He and he's really a a a, a, a good thinker about comedy, a student of comedy. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. I loved, you know, one of my great favorites, not too much remembered today as a comedian, is Albert Brooks. Uh, yeah. He too was one of those sort of anti-comedians, except, you know, yeah. he, he made fun of being a comedian. Mm -hmm. He uh, is such a brilliant guy, and that guy is one of the most, you know, naturally funny people um, on earth. Uh, and I, I, I just had a, a great time interviewing him. And I loved, I loved, you know, George Carlin was great because George Carlin, not a particularly funny guy, he does not crack jokes in, in interviews. But he is, he, he is such a uh, precise, uh, he has such a precise memory and he's, he's a little bit anal about it, I would say. He remembered every detail, he knew the dates, the places, and he just was very, and very organized about his uh, thinking about his career. So he was good. And I would follow up with, with questions to him on the phone and he would call me back always very precisely, you know, answer the questions that I needed. So. Uh, he was great. Um, I, I, I just, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the others that were so, you know, and I always liked Robert Klein and I still to this day, you know, I still talk to him and he's just uh, a fascinating guy and a really uh, intelligent guy and a funny guy. So there are a few of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there any way of, of knowing what maybe Carlin and Pryor thought of each other since they were so kind of parallel and, and on the same path? Yeah, I think they, they totally respected each other and they were f somewhat friendly. I don't, I never detected, and of course I didn't talk to Pryor, he died right. while I was um, working on the book. He was still alive when I started, but he was- He was still uh, sick, right? Uh, yeah, too sick mm -hmm. to talk. Um, but I, I believe, you know, they, they kind of worked together or, or were both in the New York comedy scene in the, in the 60s. And um, I think they were very respectful of each other. I, don't, I didn't detect any sort of competitiveness. I think they felt they were both um, kind of on the same path in their own lane. And um, I think there was a lot of, uh, I, I, you know, I, I felt all the guys, I, I never felt too much uh, competitive, you know, competitiveness. I, th I think they were all really supportive of each other. Um, right. I yeah, so even in, in, in the, uh, I'm sorry, no. I said, I don't think I came across any feuds, really. Um, <laughs> maybe there are a couple well, of hidden from me. Yeah, because even in the Robin uh, Williams interview, he was talking very highly of Carlin and calling him the Mark Twain and, and, and oh, that yeah. kind of thing. Absolutely. So there was a very- all, I think they all recognized that they were all kind of developing the same art form. I don't think they, I, I, I you know, I, I never, um, he detected any jealousy or anything. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on the state of stand-up now? Do you think uh, Do you think the legacy of what they started in the '70s has continued through? You know, I, yeah, I definitely. Uh, I feel there's a lot going on today. I don't keep uh, totally on top of the stand-up scene, but I do. You know, I do see a lot of stuff on Netflix or uh, wherever, mm -hmm. uh, um, Hannah Gadsby, you know, there's all sorts of interesting new stuff being done that I think is following in the tradition. I mean, there's the, they're experimenting with the form somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a whole alt comedy sort of right. movement that uh, yeah. expanded the form. I, I don't feel though that there is as much, you know, creatively happening in stand-up as there was back in the era I talked about. I okay. think those guys just sort of did so much with stand-up, moved it uh, so far forward. I, I don't think it can, that, that, that that much more has been done with it since then. I think there's a lot of very, very good practitioners uh, out there. But, um, and then, you know, there's definitely more, um, in terms of minorities, you know, ethnic uh, women, uh, blacks, uh, uh, you know, Asian American, etc. Et that much more of that. Mm -hmm. and I think many more voices, a much more diversity of voices, which is of course really good. 
uh, I don't think what they're doing with stand-up is that much different. They're standing up there and they're telling about their their life histories, their, their experiences, uh, either with the women or with po the police or whatever. Uh, but it's basically the same form that, that was developed, I think, uh, in, the, in the era that I talked about. Mm -hmm. So. Who do you think? Yeah, oh yeah, no, I was just gonna ask, who, who do you think in the last you know, 30 years, uh, post the era that you studied, um, have been the, the big voices that really changed, like moved it forward? Like the, the post Carlin era. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to go back since, you know, in the last, um, I mean, certainly a guy like Dave Chappelle, yeah. uh, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of taking, I think, sort of sketch comedy and stand-up comedy and merging it in, in interesting ways, certainly yeah. uh, has been a really important guy. Um, and, uh, and Hannah Gadsby, uh, you know, I, I certainly doing mm -hmm. uh, really interesting stuff right now. Uh, I don't, um, you know, I, I, the, 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 those are people recently um, going back. I mean, I think still the guy that, you know, I, the people that I laugh at today are a little bit more the traditional standards. A guy like Jim Gaffigan, I think, is just mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, you know, a really great stand-up. And um, uh, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I don't feel as well-versed in in, uh, in all the thing, you know, the yeah. stand-up comedy today. But, uh, you know, I definitely, I'm always interested in seeing, you know, the, the newcomers that are, mm -hmm. uh, that are out there and that are, that are I, I think, you know, the diversity, the, uh, the sort of uh, ethnic diversity, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, really encouraging to see all of that today. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it was towards the end of the 70s and the, kind of the beginning of the 80s and then really at the height is uh, Kinnison. I mean, he, Sam Kinnison oh, kind of takes wow. it to a whole other level too. Sure. But, you know, going, back, going back to Kinnison, definitely he, he pushed things forward and that he took, that was kind of the extreme. I yeah. mean, kind yeah, of yeah. every guy uh, and, and, um, and and you gotta say for a little while a guy like Andrew Dice Clay, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, time, right? something mm -hmm. you know pushed it into areas, you know that, you know even even a, a, a Carlin or those people wouldn't go, and I think mm -hmm. I think those people were definitely interesting uh, in in terms of moving stand-up comedy into new areas. I'm probably missing a couple of people from the, you know, from the '90s, but uh, if you, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. I love, I didn't know this, but uh, yeah. wrote about how Carlin, when he saw Kinnison, he felt like he also had to raise his voice in a, in a different yeah. way. Yeah. That was great. I think Carlin saw in Kinnison, you know, the same impulses that caused Carlin to do what he did. You know, Kinnison was trying to take it the next step forward. And then Carlin, you know, as, as his career, near the, in the latter years of his career, uh, when he was older, and boy, he he was getting really dark, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I think still really funny and and brilliant. Uh, I did see him late in his career, probably one of his maybe three or four years before he died, uh, at uh, the Beacon Theater in New York, and and I did think he was still really really great. Um, and you know, some of those those sort of angry rants he did near the end uh, were, uh, th that was pushing stand-up into new areas. Those were also very, you know, he was a, Carlin was a comedian who almost never ad-libbed. His stuff was very yeah. written out. He didn't, um, you know, he, he had that, um, I can't remember what he called it, an kind of ode to the common man or something he, that he did near the end of Oh, it. the modern man. Modern man, yeah. Yeah. That, that I'm, yeah, I, yeah, I that's quoted for you. I've got it. Um, no, I don't. I, I did know, a college paper on that one, so yeah. Okay, that, it, that's a brilliant, brilliant piece of writing. And I saw yes. him do it, I, I saw him, you know, do it at a concert, and I saw him do it on, live on stage and on TV both. And, I mean, he had that down so good. He was, he was just incredible to be able to just memorize that and do it. Uh, 
he wouldn't vary it. He did the same thing, but it was a brilliantly written piece. And um, anyway, so, but Carlin's voice, he did have to raise his voice after people like, like Kinnison, but he did it in such an interesting way. Well, it didn't sound like ranting. It sounded like, you know, really astute social commentary. Yeah, he always said uh, he, he considered himself a writer that performed his own material yeah. instead of the other way around, yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. he, he, uh, and and if, you, if you watch his, his um, material on, on old concerts and stuff, you see just how careful he is. He, he must have rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. Yeah. He just, uh, whereas, you know, another comedian like a Robert Klein or, or even a Jerry Seinfeld, you know they've got the basic joke set, but they they kind of ramble a little. They they want to make it like a conversation. That to me, you know, a, a stand up. A, you know, I'm just talking. I'm just talking. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of illusion that stand up comedians try to create. That I'm just I'm just talking. I'm just telling you about what happened to me last night or uh, my last date or or you know whatever. And you know the illusion is that they're they're just talking to you. But of course, they've got jokes uh, they've written out and they know what they're going to say. Um, I don't think Carlin um, really cared. He, he didn't so much make it sound like a conversation. I think you knew yeah. that was scripted, but it, uh -huh. was, it was so brilliant that, you know, mm -hmm. he bought it. This is a nearly a hypothetical, but what do you think about if those guys were around now, if they started out? I mean, would they be different? Would it be a different time now? Like, I can't see Lenny Bruce uh, tweeting an apology for a joke he wrote, you know? Right. <laughs> I think they'd have trouble with, um, they might have trouble with the, the political correctness today, I think is a little bit confining. Yes. Uh, I think it's great when, you know, uh, African-American comedians and the uh, Arab-American comedians, whatever, um, I, it bothers me when people have to apologize for jokes they told because they violate, yeah. you know, so that, you know, mm -hmm. irreverence is part of what being a stand-up comedian is. Yep. And I think, uh, you, you can get to, you know, the, 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 the cultural police can get a little over, overzealous there. Right. Uh, it bothers me when I see, you know, a guy like Bill Maher having to explain maybe something yeah. he said was a little out of line. Um, we know, um, who's the other comedian that uh, several others have gotten in. Oh, yeah, tons. Yeah. Yeah, have, have gotten in trouble for that. And that, you know, that bothers me a little. Even Chappelle, uh, you know, got in trouble for saying some nice things about Bill Cosby. You know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, look. He, he said, I, I, in fact, I think I was at a Chappelle concert when I, I saw Chappelle at Radio City Music Hall and he was doing, I think, some of his stuff about Cosby. And it was, it was, you, you know, meant to be a little uh, shocking, you know, he would yeah. say mm -hmm. in defense of Bill Cosby. Um, but that's, you know, that's what stand-up comedians do. And I think they should be given, given that leeway. Yep. And I think, so I think some of these guys, uh, Prior, Carlin, who knows what the, go back in their routines or what they might have said that they would have to apologize for. And I think right, yes. uh, that they would, uh, they would find that bothersome. That, that would be disturbing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. So. <laughs> um, all right. So you mentioned Chappelle and Mike and I were, were speaking, I think, was it earlier today, Mike, or was it last night? I don't remember. Um, Chappelle did the first coronavirus stand-up routine. Ah, well, I haven't seen that one. Well, it, it was like the first show back. Yeah, he was he was outside and uh, in a gazebo doing it, and it was uh, it's, it's it was been very criticized, but it was kind of like the first performance out you know in front of an audience since all the shows have been shut down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I I think now's an interesting time to. Uh, I don't want to shift the conversation too much, no. but when we're talking about performing and obviously you have theater ties. Um, and of course we read your, your piece on, uh, you know, theater in the time of <laughs> the year with the plague. Um, wh what do you see like going forward? The, the trends in, you know, stand up, which is of course a, a live performance uh, and theater, you know, particularly Broadway, which of course is live performance with people packed in and w what's going to happen you know, 12 months from now, 15 months from now? Well, if you're asking, first of all, in terms of the pandemic, I am not 
optimistic about you know Broadway's immediate future. I mean, I don't I, shows are not going to be reopened. You know, not going to open for the rest of the year and, and into next. Mm -hmm. So until we get this solved, I I really um, I, I'm sorry to say I don't know when I'm going to see Broadway theater again. Uh, I'm with you. Yeah, you know, yeah. setting aside the pandemic, the future of Broadway. Well, first of all. It's amazing that Broadway is is just so thriving, you know, before this whole health crisis. And the idea, when I started out writing about theater back in the 90s, mid 90s or so, uh, Broadway was, you know, kind of dicey. There were, there were times when there weren't even enough musicals to nominate for best home award at the end of the year because there were so few shows. Yeah. And there were the empty theaters. Um, uh, and and then you know I, I and I think you have to credit a lot Disney and and the Lion mm -hmm. for really reviving Broadway, um, making Broadway a family experience. Mm -hmm. The idea that the Lion King is just a show that that is the key show I think of our era because mm -hmm. it was a show that. Um, appealed to everybody, it appealed to kids, and it appealed to adults because it was the, the uh, theatrical innovation, and it was so, yeah. you know, exciting. And so it, it, was, it was almost experimental theater at the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that show, and just the fact that it was such a huge, huge success internationally, and it's still to this day. So that, and that brought, that I think supercharged uh, Broadway as a tourist destination, even, you know, much more than even it had been before. Families come to New York, they book their two or three or four shows with the whole family. There's enough show. There are shows that, you know, that appeal to the family. And um, so uh, Broadway has just been, you know, thriving for the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, eventually I think it'll get back to that. But boy, it may be a year or two. Um, stand up, interestingly, you know, you want to link it up with stand up. I mean, there, there is kind of a merger. You see more uh, stand-up comedians doing stuff on Broadway. I, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the John Mulaney uh, show that uh, mm -hmm. was, was just on was uh, pretty successful. And, and then you see guys like, you know, Colin Quinn does it off-Broadway. He's done it a couple on Broadway, too. So, right. um, and I've heard of other, other, you know, things in the works. So... I think uh, one man show, one person shows are, are uh, you know, more, you, you see them more often on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, I, so, you know, I, I, I think Broadway is going to continue once it gets, we, you know, solve this health crisis, Broadway is going to continue to be, um, you know, exciting. And, um, you know, Hamilton, of course, it, Probably after the Lion King, the, you know, the next most important show of the last you know, couple of days. Agreed. Yeah. Definitely Hamilton Agreed. and what that has done. And who would have mm -hmm. expected it? I mean, I saw that <laughs> yeah. off Broadway and, you know, I thought it was very good and, and wow. Uh, but I, I, the idea that it would be the phenomenon that it had become, I would not have predicted. So, <laughs> but good for that. And that, that is taken, you know, Broadway in an, in an even new direction. And, um, yeah in uh, opening it up to, to hip hop and and, mm -hmm. and hip hop in a in a, a really serious show that uh, that is historically interesting and, and packed with information almost too much to absorb in one yep. the idea that that show mm -hmm. is is just the hottest show on Broadway is uh, like astonishing and and encouraging heartening and exciting I have to or, say, uh, you're asking me though about Broadway, I, I do think though, the last couple of years, um, I've been, you know, somewhat disappointed in Broadway's, you know, I, I haven't seen that much mm -hmm. uh, since Hamilton. It's been, you know, exciting. I'm, I'm a little bit, got it, getting a little bit bored with the revivals and yeah. Yeah. musicals yeah. based on movies that is sort of very predictable. Uh, I don't think there have been any breakthroughs in the last couple of seasons. Do you think Hamilton has raised the bar almost too high for other producers to match? Oh, no, I think it's a goal. And, and okay. I, but you're certainly not seeing any, 
everybody's there more shows are being developed and there you know i uh, again you know pandemic aside uh, mm. i think that's just you know inspired people as a boy you know we can really hit the jackpot and maybe uh, encourage more experimentation mm -hmm. i mean if somebody had said you know five years ago a hip-hop musical about alexander <laughs> hamilton i mean oh my god i doubt he could have gotten you know one out of ten producers interested in even pursuing it <laughs> uh i think that that it, its success probably will in you know make it easier to to do other experimental mm -hmm. kind of musicals and plays too hopefully mm -hmm. what do you think this plague <laughs> i want to call it a plague what do you think this pandemic or this plague will will what kind of effect do you think it will have on Broadway? Like, what, what do you see? You know what? I, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I really don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like, what I'm interested in is, you know, I think you might be able to get, you know, people into the theater spaced out properly, but what about the actors and, uh, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, can an actor kiss another actor? I, yeah. I bet there'll be some some sat satirical kind of kind of works done on 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 uh, the, the the social distancing issue, mm -hmm. and so you might have that become a topic of of, of Broadway theater. Yeah. Um, but boy, I, I yeah, the social distancing that. phantom. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I I'll, I don't know what it, I don't know what to think. It is really a a, a conundrum. Yeah. Uh, I think that every thing is probably on hold and, you know, in terms of developing new stuff, because people are waiting to see how things shake out. And, and, and you know, it's a very tough, Broadway could, you know, if you have to enforce social distancing in the theater and say you can only have 50% capacity right. in, your, in your theater, um, that makes it almost financially impossible to make money on yeah. a Broadway show. Because you can't survive on fifty percent capacity, you have to have seventy-five or eighty percent at yeah. least to make money on a show. So I, I just don't know what's going to happen. I think it's going to have to, for Broadway really to come back, we're going to have to be totally beyond this pandemic. We're going to have to be back to normal, uh, where you can pack an audience. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, that's unfortunately a ways away. So. I don't expect to be going back, and, you know, reviewing shows for, for quite a while. Yep. Yeah. And I haven't been able to get into, you didn't ask me, but I'll volunteer. The yes. theater on TV is not a satisfying experience. No. I, I am I'm watching this week. There's some off-Broadway show that is streaming live, a new show that, look, I think it's, it may be about the pandemic. Um, but I, 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 I do want to try it and see what it's yeah. like. But every time I, I kind of sample some streaming um, theater piece, I just can't do it. It's, there's such different experiences. I've never, oh, yeah. I've never been able to watch uh, the National Theater live from, from London. Uh, though there are, you know, I know people who love them. Mm -hmm. Productions, I love the National Theater uh, in mm -hmm. London. And, um, you know, so much of their stuff is worth, worth seeing. But, but um, watching it in a, in a movie theater or at home is just, I can't do it. It's just, and I, I just don't like watching theater on TV. It, it's not it's live theater if you're watching it yeah. on television. I've, I've tried to watch the Metropolitan Opera streaming shows. Right. It, it's not the same experience at all. And right. I, saw, um, I saw the National Theater's Macbeth on, the, on a movie theater, in a movie theater a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a good, good production not yeah. the same as being there yeah i know. know uh no i get very antsy watching in a theater i think i did it i can't remember what i tried it for something a couple mm -hmm. of years ago and, and that was the last <laughs> but do you think that that's gonna have to be a viable option in the next year or so if people want to experience theater <sighs> i hope not because <laughs> I, yeah it's not the same thing no, I, hear, not, I hear that they did a really good job with Hamilton. I didn't watch it, but I, I hear that, you know, it's, it's really well put together. Yeah, it is, yeah. I, I watched it. It's, it is uh, well done. Uh, 
uh, someone pointed out uh, on a Twitter, on a, on a tweet I saw, someone in the theater said, yeah, but they, boy, they spent a lot of money uh, on that production. And most mm -hmm. sort of transcriptions of Broadway shows that you see just are, are, are much less sophisticated, much more, I, I'm, I'm sure, sort of standard a camera just showing them on stage. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, you know, I think it, it can be done in a way that makes it more of a cinematic experience. Um, but, but usually when they just film a Broadway show, it's done very simply and, and not, not very uh, interesting as a TV or movie experience. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be a TV or movie experience. It's supposed to be a, a one, one view from your seat. So. Yeah. Well, be mm -hmm. Before we wrap up, I want to ask God, uh, do you have, when you think back of theater, is there one memory or one show that you always, that this brings you back to like, oh, that was it. That was, that was a good time. That was a fun experience. Well, uh, you know, I, I say the Lion King because I actually was the first person to, I, I went to Minneapolis to see their pre-Broadway production of the Lion King. And the idea of being, being in on the ground floor of that groundbreaking show was a, a really memorable experience for me. Um, but I've had, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, you know, the, the last few years, uh, the highlights, I, I mean, I think a, a musical like Come From Away was a, a really, really nice show, a really high point of the last few years, aside from Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, I would, um, I'll think of something else when, once we're- <laughs> No, The Lion King's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of The Lion King, no problem there. Yeah. But going back, actually, um, I, I remember um, it's, it's, uh, memorable th as memorable theater evenings go, here, I'll give you a really obscure one. Terrence McNally just died. Mm -hmm. Terrence McNally, the playwright, um, and, and he's, he did a lot of stuff, Love, Valor, Compassion, and, and so forth. But um, I remember my, one of my very first theater experiences in New York was seeing one of his one act plays called Next. And, and it was on a double bill with two short plays, Adaptation by Elaine May and Next by Terrence McNally. And it is, that was one of the funniest plays I've ever seen. And that, if, if, I, had, uh, if I had somebody to, um, if I wanted to revive somebody, I'd like to revive Terrence McNally's one act plays when he was young and he wrote, he wrote a bunch of these uh, very funny one act plays and that, that would be one. So that was what one of my first, that was my first trip to New York on my own and I saw that, oh. that show. So that was my first um, um, important New York theater experience. I feel like I know next for some reason. Is, is that the one with the, with the cycle of dates? No, no, no else. It, it's about a guy, it's, this is back in the Vietnam era. And this is a guy who gets called to the draft board. He gets drafted by mistake. And he, he and it, the, whole, the whole play takes place between the recruiting sergeant, who's a woman, and this guy who basically says, I got drafted by mistake. And it is, uh, it is just a terrific little okay. Totally forgotten today, but uh, I would like to look it up the uh, the, uh, the oeuvre of uh, Terrence McNally in his younger days. Good, I have a new play to read now. <laughs> well, th thank you, so, Jay. You got any more? Uh, thank you so much, man. No, I'm all set. That was amazing. All right. Well, I hope I gave you enough. Oh, oh no, no, that was great. Yeah. And oh, that was amazing. That was, that was, I was geeking I out so the whole much. time. So. <laughs> Well, it was great to talk to you guys. Good luck on your project. and uh, Thank you. And, and thanks for writing this. This was really something special to read. So thank oh, you. Good. I still get, uh, yeah, lots of comments about it. I know that, uh, I know that that is, you know, the definitive uh, history of that era. And, um, you know, I'm proud to have written it.